Okay. Take your Bibles and turn to Mark 6, and while you're doing that, I'll tell you what that's about. I went down, just came back from the youth rally. We took, how many kids were with us? Ten kids. There were 14 people all together, but it was 10 kids uh, who went down. And um, the theme this year was pickles and pigs and pickles. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I it was there. That was our team pig. So <laughs> we, the, we had, there were, eventually there will be on our Facebook thing, our account, there will be pictures of the, the youth, the group with the pig, because that's what they had to do, take selfie pictures all over the camp in all different things. It was interesting. So it was fun. We had a great time. The, I'll put him under the pulpit. You don't want to have to look at him anymore. Well, so he actually would be better than looking at me. But, <laughs> um, but we had a good time. The, uh, the, the activities were fun. The preaching was good. We had a good time. There were a good group of kids. Didn't really affect too many people. The, the weather, it was snowing down there, um, which is the first time ever. I've been to eight of these youth rallies. Um, in the past, and we've had cold weather, but never snow. Uh, now they've had snow. That's a, you know, an unusual thing for a But it was fun. We had a good time, and thank you for your prayers for us. Kids who went, Lord, we still use His word in their hearts. <clears throat> We're going to Mark 6 today. There's a reason. I wasn't quite where I wanted to be on my message in 1 Corinthians by the time we had to leave. I wasn't staying up and working on it when I got home. So, uh, we're looking at Mark 6 today. Mark 6, verses 1 to 6. See if uh, Steve has read it. Let's look. Father, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you for the opportunity. We have to look at your word today. I pray you'd be with us now as we consider it, the truths that are in it, that you'd use it in our hearts. I pray you'd be with us and bless in all that's done. Give us a great day. Lord, prepare our hearts. If there's one here who does not know you as their Savior, the Lord, please, that he or she come to you. Lord, if there's one here that's not right, bring them back to you. Bring your blessings to in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to get you up to speed in Mark chapter 6. By Mark chapter 6, Jesus had just stopped an incredibly nasty storm on the Sea of Galilee. He cast out thousands of demons. He had healed a woman who had an incurable disease that immediately revives a dead girl. Anyone buddy, who was paying attention, anybody who was even really thinking, would have said, this Jesus guy rocks. This is amazing. Look what he can do. Jesus then returns to his hometown. Coming home. It's hometown of Nazareth. You know, after all we've seen Jesus do, the healing of the demon, you know, casting out of demons, the healing of the woman, the raising of somebody from the dead, the making a guy who was lame walk, all this stuff. You would think that the townspeople would give him the keys to the city, that they would celebrate Jesus days. And then they'd carry him around on their shoulder, and then the, daily, the, the Nazareth Daily Herald would read, Local Boy Makes Good. <laughs> You'd think it would be something like that. We're flabbergasted that his own people disregard him. Look at verse 5, chapter 6. It says, And he could, and he could there do no mighty works. Say he laid his hand on a few sick folks, and he would. It says that he couldn't do any mighty works there. You know, if you examine this passage, 
I think we can come up with some reasons why he couldn't do any of those things. And I think we need to look at that today so that we don't make our, that we aren't guilty of the same things that made it so that he couldn't accomplish better what he wanted to accomplish. You know, if you examine the passage, it says here that he makes a statement that, that um, he could do no mighty works there because of the, the, their lack of faith. I don't think it means that his power was somehow diminished by their unbelief. That's not the truth. It may suggest that because of their unbelief, people were not coming to him for healing or miracles the way that they had in Capernaum and Jerusalem and all the other places. Or possibly it may signify that Jesus limited his own ministry there. Maybe as an act of mercy so that they wouldn't harden their hearts further. Or possibly as an act of judgment. Judgment on them. You know, he had power to do more miracles. But because they rejected him, they weren't done. See, miracles belong to those who are ready to believe. You know, why didn't, wasn't Jesus able to do miraculous things there? I think there's two reasons. I think the reasons that he could not do what he needed to do there was, first of all, because they failed to recognize who he really was. Go with me to chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm going to begin reading once again in verse 1. It says, He went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, For whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this, which is given unto him, that even as such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. <coughs> you know, who do they really think that he is? Who do they think he is? I want us to notice, first of all, what they say. When they are looking at him, they're saying, he's doing all this stuff. They hear who he says he is. <laughs> but what do they say? Isn't this the carpenter? Their response to him is, oh, he's the carpenter. The people of Nazareth still thought he was the one who carried on his father's trade. The word that's used there that's translated carpenter comes from the word to create. And originally it applied to a worker in wood or a builder of wood like a carpenter. Eventually, it began, began to refer to anyone who was a craftsman. A worker in wood or in stone or metal. <laughs> Some believe that in Palestine, where wood was rather rare, very possibly the word carpenter actually referred to somebody who was a stonemason instead. But we're not really 100% sure. It, it means that he was a worker with his hands. You know, Jesus may well have built the synagogues all throughout Galilee. <coughs> Justin Martyr, who was a early preacher, not too many years after Jesus, spoke often of the plows and yokes made by Jesus, and that they were still being used to that day. Jesus was a common worker, a blue-collar laborer. He had no formal training. He wasn't a scholar, and these people knew it. And they couldn't get past him. They said, isn't he the carpenter? Notice what else they say about him. They say he's a carpenter. They say, the son of Mary? You know, he's only called this here. It's, it's a common practice was to identify the son by the father. That was done all throughout the Bible. You know, we refer to David sometimes as David ben Jesse, or Ben is the Hebrew word for son, son of. David, son of Jesse. Often they were referred to and, and referenced as being the son of their father. Perhaps it's done here because Joseph is dead. 
And off, most people believe that by this time, Joseph is dead. Or maybe the people were bringing up the rumors. The rumors that had clogged Jesus' ministry for many, many years. The rumors of an illegitimate birth. In John 8, 40, in John 8, 41, when Jesus is dealing with the disciple, with the uh, Pharisees and rebuking them, they make a comment to him. Ah, I'll, I'll go over there. We'll read the context. John 8, verse 41. Jesus says in verse 40. But uh, now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which ye have heard of God, this did not Abraham. He said, you knew the works of your father. Now he's going to tell them who their father is later on. He tells them in John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father he will do. But in verse 40, 41 they say, then they said unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. The reference there was they were saying, we're not born of fornication, and you are. See, they're, refer they're referring to the virgin birth and saying, it wasn't that. It was fornication. That's possibly what they're referring to. And possibly also they're making reference to the fact that as Jesus as the eldest son of his father, after the death of his father, had the responsibility to take care of the family. And there were people there who believed that he had abandoned that responsibility by beginning his itinerant ministry and going around with these disciples and teaching and preaching. And they very possibly are referencing that and saying, aren't you the son of Mary? The one that's walked away? The one that's not taking care of the responsibility? And what else do they say about him? They said, is he not the brother of Judas and uh, Joseph and uh, James and Judas, Joseph and Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. By the way, without being mean, there are some who teach in teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She had many children after Jesus. She was not a perpetual virgin. Once Jesus was born, it was a normal relationship between her and her husband. And there were children as a result of it. James, Joseph, Judah, sisters, several, several family members. That's a distortion, by the way. See, they refused to see him as anything higher than themselves. They looked at Jesus, they said, He's a craftsman, blue-collar worker. His mom lived here. His brothers lived here. And in fact, he's not doing what he should be doing. He's nothing that we need to believe in him. They refused to accept him as the Son of God and as the Messiah. And God said he was. But who was he really? Look at verse 4. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. And among his own kin and his own house. Jesus, here in this passage, identifies himself as a prophet, a fourth speaker from God. Prophet refers to several things. We think of a prophet, we think of the fact that they would tell, foretell the future, but they also for, they would foretell truth. He was a, a speaker of God, a foreteller of truth. We're told in another passage, he is in fact the Messiah. John chapter 4, verse 26. John 4, 26. The woman said in verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. It was a direct claim to the fact that he in fact was the Messiah, the Christ. 
He was the one that was sent by God, the one to deal with the sins of the world. He was the Son of Man with the power of God. In Mark chapter six, uh, 2, verse 10. In Mark chapter 2, verse 10, it says, that he came up that, uh, the context here in John, uh, I mean in Mark chapter 2, is, to let kind of remind you, is the men born of four, the man born of four, when they brought this guy in, the, the guy who couldn't walk, they brought him to the house, the house is full, it's loaded up with people, they can't get in, and these guys decide they're going to take the roof off the house and lower Jesus down the roof. Now that's not as much of a construction disaster then as it is now, to take the roof off the house and lower somebody through it. But they, so they removed the tiles of the roof and lowered him through. And Jesus, when he sees the man, says, Son, your sins be forgiven thee. Everybody around there immediately starts, because this. even though Jesus is being followed by many people who believe he is special, he's also being followed by a lot of people who are trying to find fault. There are Pharisees there. There are others there who are trying to find fault. So Jesus says to him, Son, your sins be forgiven thee. And says, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their heart, verse 6, Why does this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say thy, uh, uh, to the sick of the palsy, Thy sin be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So he's the Son of Man that has the power of God, the power to forgive sins. He says, Arise, take up thy bed. So Jesus is a prophet, a foreteller. He's the Messiah of Christ, the promised Messiah, the promised from Scripture. He is, in fact, the Son of Man with the power of God, the power to forgive sin. He's, in fact, we're told the Son of God. Mark chapter 5, verse 22. These are claims, by the way, that Jesus makes it himself. I'm going to give you a few other statements about Christ in just a second that are not made by him himself, but are made by others without him. But in John chapter 5, verse 22, John 5, 22, he says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. He's the Son of God. Not only are we told that, we're told that he in fact is God. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word there is referring to Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehovah's Witnesses translated was a God. There is not any way grammatically possible to stick that A in there without taking the Greek language and literally ripping it apart and standing it on its head. It does not belong there. Even people who do not believe that Jesus is God will tell you that doesn't belong there. Was a mistranslation done to, in fact, purport their view? He's the Son of God. He was God. And how do we know that's referring to Jesus himself, by the way? Because in verse 14 it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, begotten Son of the Father. Full of grace and truth. He was God. He was the creator. In Colossians chapter 1, Jesus, I mean, now Paul in the book of Colossians makes several statements regarding Jesus in the early parts of the book of Colossians. I just want to look at those just for a second. Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of the, every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. It is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the creator. <clears throat> he is, in fact, the creator God, the creator of our world. 
The word, the word consist in verse 17, it says, where by him all things consist, literally means held together. So not only is he the creator of our world, he's the one that keeps it functioning. It keeps it doing what it's supposed to do. So that our world doesn't fly apart. He's the creator. He's a savior. First Corinthians, I mean Colossians 1.14. In him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Not only is he, not only is he a prophet, he's Messiah. He's the Son of God, the, the, the Son of Man with the power of God. He's the Son of God. He's God. He's the creator and sustainer of the world. He's the Savior. He's the head of the church. Colossians 1, verse 18. And he is the head of the church. Head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. <coughs> that in him all things might have. That in all things he might have the preeminence. He's in fact the head of the church. He's the one that's supposed to be in charge. He's the one we're supposed to follow. He's the one that's supposed to tell us what to do. So we're to listen to him and follow him. You know, skeptics stumble over the identity of Jesus as, they, as the Dallas people of Nazareth did too. They have a problem with that today. There are many people who will argue with you. Oh, I don't think that's really true. That can't be true. You know, maybe you're here today and you've never been saved. You don't know if you're your saved. What can I tell you about Jesus today? He's a savior of your soul. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sins so you don't have to because you can't. You can't. It's not just he did it so you didn't have to do it. He did it because you can't do it. to the cross and paid for the sin of all mankind and he could do that because he was sinless. We're not sinless. Regardless of how good you are, each and every one of us is a sinner. That's what we are. The Bible tells us that. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, It's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Every one of us is a sinner. We're born that way. It's what we are. We're sinners. Some are bigger sinners. Some are littler sinners. Some people do a lot more sin. Some people do a little bit less. But every one of us is a sinner. And because of our sin, God says we deserve something. We deserve death and death in hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Savior of your soul. He died for you so you can have eternal life. Should you live your life? He is the Prince of Peace. He can give us the peace that we cannot get otherwise. They weren't able to do their, Jesus was not able to do what he needed to do there or wanted to do there because they failed to recognize who he really was. But also because they refused to put their faith in him. Look at verse 3 of Mark chapter 6. Give me one second. I'm going to back there. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark 6, 3, it says, <clears throat> Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah, and Simon, are not his sisters with us? And they were offended at him. The Bible tells us they were offended at him. The English word scandalize comes from the Greek word that's translated offended. They were offended. That's where that word comes from. Essentially means to stumble or to become ensnared. They couldn't get past the fact that they kind of knew where he was from. That they'd seen his family. They couldn't get over that. The residents of Nazareth were deeply offended at Jesus' posturing himself as a great teacher because of his ordinary background. 
his limited formal training, his lack of, of an officially sanctioned position. They looked at him and they said, who is he to teach us anything? He's no better than us. He's no more important than me. I, who is he? They were scandalized. They were offended. We're also told they were unbelieving in verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And went around about the villages teaching. <laughs> Faith should have been the response that, that, that many in that town had. This is a region where Jesus did many of his miracles. And so much of his teaching in the region around Galilee. If you study the Gospels, most of his teaching was in Galilee. This is where Nazareth is. Nazareth is in Galilee. He's been teaching there, doing miracles there. Much of it's been done in that area. And they don't get it. They were unbelieving. They failed to believe. I'm going to go just for a couple verses real quickly. Go with me back to chapter 2, verse 5. I want to read several verses. So when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Unto the sake of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Go with me to chapter 4, verse 40. This is the context of the whole calming of the sea. In verse 40, he says to his disciples, he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it ye have no faith? Chapter 5, verse 34. And he said unto her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. And behold thy plague. Verse 36, it says, And as soon as Jesus heard the words that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Verse 35, the, during the time when he had dealt with this individual, they came, he was on his way to the, the ruler of the synagogue's home, his daughter was sick, and they came in verse 35, it says, And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard of these words that he spoke, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Faith and believe are used interchangeably in the book of Mark and often used interchangeably in the book of John and numerous other places. That faith is to relinquish trust in ourselves and to transfer that trust to someone else or something else. The woman in the synagogue who had a hemorrhage for years, she had an issue of blood, the Bible says it was. At first she had put her trust in what? The doctors. The Bible tells us she had spent her entire living on the doctors that she was tr trusting to heal her. But in Mark chapter 2, as Jesus walked by, she said unto, to herself, we'll go, we'll go there actually, read it, verse 28, where she said, I have, actually we'll go up a little farther, verse 25, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, had suffered many things of many physicians, had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She heard that Jesus came in, to, uh, and when she had heard of Jesus, came into the press behind him, the crowd behind him, and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I will be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. <laughs> And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, 
And sayest thou, who touched me? <coughs> Look round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He said to her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and behold thy plague. When she reached for Jesus' robes, she was believing. She transferred her trust in the doctors to this guy, Jesus. She reached out and touched him. After she had been healed, Jesus said to her, did he say, your touching made you whole? No, he said, your faith hath made you whole. Believe and trust, faith, use often interchangeably. And the problem is to us, that often gets, we lose the idea in the context. The problem is, our context is not their context. <laughs> we are a group of people who the majority of us have grown up all of our life knowing who Jesus was, or at least kind of knowing who he was. You go to church, you hear about Jesus. People say, oh, I've always believed in Jesus. Well, let me explain a little bit of difference of the idea of what belief then meant to them. These were Jewish people. Had all of their life been trusting in what? Jewish sacrificial system. They are turning from the sacrificial system saying, this thing I've been trusting in, all this stuff I've been doing, I'm no longer trusting in the stuff I'm doing. I'm going to turn to Jesus. See what that word means? That's the word repentance, by the way. The Bible used in the scriptures says often, he says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. The word of repentance actually has the idea of a change of mind that results in a change of direction. What you've been trusting in, you stop trusting in. You've been trusting in yourself. I'm going to get to heaven because I'm a good person. No, you're not. <coughs> I'm going to get to heaven because I'm a church member. No, you're not. I'm going to get to heaven because I do good things. No, you're not. The Jews of Jesus' day didn't get to heaven by doing all the good things. They got to heaven when they realized that what they were doing didn't do them any good. And they turned from that and turned to Jesus and said, I believe. What were they believing? They were believing, number one, that he was God. He was God. He was Messiah. Everything they've been trusting in was doing them no good. We can sometimes get the idea people say, well, I believe. I've always believed. Really? I've always believed. I, I've been believed since I was a little baby. Really? No, you didn't. Nobody believes from the time they're a little baby. You've got to sometime turn from what you were trusting in and trust in God. Belief. Faith. It's used in John all the time. I think 97 times, something like that, 100 times. It's something used a lot. It's used in a lot of the other books, and it's often used interchangeably. Because to them, it meant the same thing. When you believed in God and you trusted in God, you were no longer trusting in what you had been trusting in. You were now trusting that in Jesus alone, and not by good works, and not by a church, and not by anything else are you going to get to heaven. You're going to get to heaven by trusting in what he had done for you because you could not do it. In John chapter, no, it's Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch is riding around in the desert, Philip 
catches up to him. And this guy wants to get baptized. And Philip says to him, you know, he says, what doth hinder me to be baptized? He says, if you believe, you may. He says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, why is that significant? It's significant for two reasons. Number one, this guy was trusting. He was a, he was a proselyte to Judaism before. He says, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. They had just been reading what? The book of Isaiah talking about the suffering, the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And he says, I believe all that was from me. <coughs> Fact of the matter is this. Jesus died so that we could have eternal life because we couldn't get there. And no amount of trusting in anything else. No amount of trusting in church, regardless of what church. No amount of trusting in good works, regardless of what good works. No amount of trusting in anything else will get us there. We need to put our faith and trust in Christ alone, without the works of all. Jesus died. Why couldn't they do, why couldn't Jesus do what he needed to do there? Because number one, they didn't really under, even understand who he was. And they wouldn't believe in him and put their faith in him. We can limit God's working in our lives if we're not careful. Number one, if you're not saved here, you can obviously limit his working in your life. But you can limit his working in your life if you fail to recognize and fail to put your trust in him now. He's the power of God resting on him. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We need to put our trust in him to believe that's true. I don't always understand. In fact, there's a lot of times We need to put our trust in Him, put our faith in Him, and follow Him fully, even when it doesn't make sense. Jesus would very soon go out of Nazareth, not to go back much again, because Nazareth, they had pretty much made it so He couldn't do anything there, because they failed to realize who He was, and they failed to believe Him. If you're here today and there's never been a time you put your faith and trust in Christ. And you stop trusting in what you've been trusting in. And turn instead to Him. He needs to do that. But if you're here today and you do know Him as your Savior, you've accepted Him as your Savior, you, you have. You've done that. But maybe you're not trusting Him for everything else. Maybe your faith has begun to wane. And you're not believing the promises of saints. Because sometimes we look at things that go on in our lives and we say, I don't think that is good. He says, all oh, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And we look at things and we say, that's not good. I don't like it. Something's wrong. We need to put our trust in Christ. We need to put our faith in Him, rest in Him, believe what He says, put our trust in His Word, get in His Word, and allow Him to change our lives and make us what He wants us to be. Listen. Father, I thank you for this day you've given. I thank you for the challenge of your words. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. To not limit you or your ability to work in our lives by our lack of faith in you. Lord, I pray if there's one here today who doesn't know you as their Savior, that Lord, they would come to know you before they would leave this place. But Lord, I pray if there's any here who don't, because of their lack of trust, their lack of faith, have begun to limit you I pray you work in the way. 
I pray you just continue to work and bless now and all that's done. Help us that we would honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take your hymn book if you would and turn with me to hymn number six, uh, 407, no, sorry, 408.